Okay, in this section, we're going to talk about uh, getting really strong thinking caps, statistical thinking caps on, and doing some critical thinking, some analysis of how information is presented to you, and you being able to uh, think critically about uh, what that information is saying and how it might be manipulated or abused. And a proverb to go along with that, uh, leave the presence of a fool, for there you do not meet words of knowledge. Sur and the, uh, the contemporary uh, interpretation would be surround yourself with critical thinkers. The more people that uh, you surround you that can think critically, uh, that means your critical thinking skills are going to go up. So surround yourself with those types of friends. Um, so here we go. Abuses of statistics. This is going to be a list of abuses of statistics and things can, that can go wrong uh, when people believe things that are not necessarily true. So here's the list we're going to go through in this section. Bad samples, small samples, loaded questions, misleading graphs, pictographs, precise numbers, distorted percentages, partial pictures, deliberate distortions. Uh, these are all uh, ways that statistics can statistics can be abused okay here's some uh, examples of the first three um, and if, uh, so bad samples inappropriate methods uh, methods to collect data or a bias ex uh, example for instance using phone books to sample data there's a lot of people that don't have phone numbers right um, there's a lot of homeless people that don't have uh, phone numbers necessarily uh, but I find that a lot of people do even though <laughs> they're uh, they're without a home because um, we need to be connected uh, small samples. If the sample is too small, it's not a representative sample of the population that you're studying. We will talk about sample size later in the course, but I want to make sure you understand that you can actually have too big of a sample, sample size. For instance, if I was going to study how many of you guys um, want to uh, eat certain type of pizza, right? Different pizza types. And I'm only interested in the uh, class, you guys, you guys are my population. But I go and study the entire college, that would not make sense, right? Then my sample size is too big, and the entire college actually might have pizza, uh, you know, pizza, uh, there might be, they might have other pizza types that they like more so than uh, those, pizza ty those pizza types that you guys like in our class, right? So studying your population means that you're going to take the population or less, not necessarily more. So larger samples could actually be problems too, not just small samples. And again, small samples are bad because, for instance, if I uh, want to know the favorite pizza type of our class and I just asked one person, for instance, um, and assumed that person's um, favorite pizza type is the same as um, everybody else is in the class, that's too small of a sample. Uh, the third one here is loaded questions. Survey questions can be worked to elicit a desired response. So voluntary response sample, we looked at this, um, this, uh, uh, this difference between um, literary digest poll and um, the other poll, uh, that, uh, the Gallup poll that got it right, and we said that, look, the first pe person, the first group got it wrong because they did bad sampling. Uh, also, voluntary response sample, self-selected sample, when people actually want to hear their opinion, uh, for others to hear their opinion, of course they're going to take the survey, right? People who are not opinionated, maybe, uh, would not take the survey, and hence you're not collecting everybody's data necessarily. So if a study uses this kind of sampling method, we can only draw conclusions about the population of people who responded. Because those people who didn't respond, right, you can't draw conclusions about them or that group. So be careful with that. As I mentioned, small uh, sample sizes, how many people like pizza? If I only asked a couple people and a lot of people said, no, nope, I don't like people, I don't like pizza, uh, then um, just one person or two people is not a representative sample of the class or of the whole. And then loaded questions, something like this. Uh, do you want to save the life of a pet? Now, who wouldn't, right? That's a, that's a question that's loaded with an agenda. And so be careful when you do surveys, for instance, or when you ask people, that you ask in such a way that the question's not loaded, that the person is not uh, pushed to answer a certain way. Here's another one. Should the president have the line item veto to eliminate waste? When put that way, of course, sure, we want to eliminate waste, so let him have the line item veto uh, to eliminate waste. But if you put the question, 
as should the president have the line item veto? Well, there's a lot of laws that we'd like to pass, for instance, that the uh, president might say, nope, it's not going to happen. And so a lot of people might say, um, you know, yeah, I don't think he should. And so depending on what the uh, formulation of the question is, uh, you would have different responses. 97% would say yes to the first, and then only 57% uh, would say yes uh, to the second question. Okay, keep uh, that in mind. And now let's uh, just camp out on misleading graphs. There's a lot of different uh, misleading graphs that we can uh, look at. Here's some. So it looks like the t category or the title of this is salaries of people with bachelor's degrees and with high school diplomas. It looks like the salary of the in the first graph in part A of high school diploma is way lower than those of uh, people who have a bachelor's degree, right? Uh, it looks like it's less than 50%. And over here, it looks like there's not that big of a difference. Again, high school diploma and bachelor's degree. Do you notice what the difference is? Just take three seconds. The difference is that this scale starts at zero and this scale starts at 20,000. So it's like you're zooming into this difference over here, right? This difference is pretty big when you've zoomed into it like this. Um, so it's like cutting off this box right here and that's it. And please note that people do this all the time. They just don't start with, they don't start with zero. They start with some other number and then they exaggerate the difference, uh, exaggerate the difference between two things. Here's another example of that. Um, the most common trick with graphs is to make the scale not start at zero so that the differences look uh, a lot bigger. So here's the difference of uh, between unemployment rate in Clinton years and Bush years. And you would say that, whoa, there's a pretty big difference. But again, take a look at the numbers themselves, 5.2052 and 5.1852. Um, we've zoomed into um, the just the top portions of those two columns. We don't start with zero and also look at the scale. The scale is very uh, incremental, right? Um, they've used tenths or thousands uh, to separate all these pieces into so that they can zoom in even more. Um, okay, there's not that much that big of a deal, two hundredths of a percent, if you will, uh, if they're uh, counting this by percents. So keep that in mind. Graphs can be misleading when they have a different scale or when they don't start at zero. Okay, uh, what about this one? This pie chart is totally incorrect. Think about uh, the sizes of the pieces. 265 million in the city, so arena funding. And then on the right side, do those add up to half of the whole? If you add up all of these pieces, 265, 10, 85, and 50, and then what's half of that? Well, half of that would not be these added up. That's a lot less, right? So keep that in mind that even though the, um, even though the, uh, channel here, <laughs> this is really weird, even though Fox uh, News here is trying to communicate something to us, they are representing it in a misleading way. So be careful of how things are being, uh, uh, how you're being misled. And I mean, think about it, you're watching the news, and they have this picture on for what, five seconds at the most? And so you're affected by this data, even though you didn't even have a chance to react, to analyze it. So we need to be quick to analyze uh, the numerical values more than how the data is presented to us. And that's what this is. We should analyze the numerical information given in the graph instead of being misled by the general shape of the graph. So keep that in mind. Pictographs. When people use pictures uh, in their graphs. In this picture, the graph, uh, in the graph of this picture, uh, the 2000 picture is about eight times bigger than the 1960 image. However, when we check on the vertical scale, uh, the 2000 is only two and a half times bigger. Now, what's the issue here? Going from this small pictograph here to this huge picture, uh, excuse me, picture here to this picture here in this pictograph, that's what this is called because it's being, pictures are being used instead of just vertical bars. The issue here is two dimensionality. It's not just the height, which uh, is being presented here, which is the only thing that we're interested in, right? Just the height but there's a second dimension, a horizontal dimension that's being presented by the pictures. And so now we're affected not by vertical one-dimensional distance, but area, two-dimensional area, right? 
And because uh, area here is a lot bigger, we're saying, whoa, there's a lot more trash in 2000 than in 1960 uh, when it's not that big of a difference. Uh, there is a difference, of course. It's pretty big, but it's not that big of a difference as claimed by the um, uh, pictographs. Okay, So keep that in mind, area. Also, alignment of the pictures. Now think about this. Here's co fruit collected. Four bananas. Wait. It looks like there's more bananas collected, but there's the same amount of apples and the cherries. So evenly spaced out pic pictographs would make more sense here than um, how they're spaced out or the size of the pictures themselves. Be careful of that. Here's a list. I'll just read it through uh, for you guys to assimilate and to say, yeah, okay, I get that point. Here's different ways that graphs can be misleading, and it's a summary. So the first one here was scale, not starting at zero. Scale made very small to make graphs look very big, right? We looked at uh, the unemployment rate between Clinton and Bush years. Scale to be made very small. Scale values are labels missing from the graph, like you don't have no clue what the scale is. That's misleading as well. Incorrect scale placed on the graph, right? When it's uh, counts by twos, and then counts by fives, and then whatever it counts by, that's misleading as well. Incorrect scales. Pieces of a pie chart are not correct sizes. We saw that with the Fox News arena funding example. Oversized volumes of objects that are too big for vertical scale differences that they represent, right? There's a vertical difference, but now they are actually representing volumes or areas, right? And so volume would be third dimension. Uh, I'll go over here. So, for instance, this would be an example of right here volume, right? There's three dimensions to these boxes. And volume is also uh, used to mislead people and not just area, as we saw in this example right here with the garbage and the trash. Um, size of the images and pictographs being different for the different categories being graphed. That's an issue. That's the area. And then graph being non standard shape or size. So, if there's uh, misleading, if the graph is misleading because it's way too big or way too small. Okay, so that was pictographs, precise numbers, distorted percentages, and then deliberate distortions. Just really quickly run through those. When somebody uh, actually reports back at a very precise number, that's misleading. So if somebody says there are 103,215,027 households in the US, would you believe them? That sounds like somebody actually counted, right? There's houses being built left and right, and there's houses being torn down left and right in different areas of the, of the country. It's actually better to say and give an estimate in this case instead of giving a precise number um, to be more accurate. So to say that there is about 103 million households would be better. So precise number numbers are giving, they're an abuse of statistics because they're stating something that's not necessarily true and also gating authority because it looks like you've counted, right? Distorted percentages, 100% improvement also doesn't mean uh, it's perfect, right? When we have improved by 100%. Uh, and then deliberate distortions, when people actually lie because they have something to gain out of it. When the author of a study has motivation to tell only part of the story or to present results inaccurately. That's deliberate distortions. So here's one of them, distorted percentages. For instance, U.S. Airways claims they've improved their rate of lost baggage by 100%. Wow, that sounds pretty good. That, that really tells you that they're probably not going to lose their baggage, right? Well, is it a, there's zero chance of them losing your baggage? No, that's not the case. But they're misleading by claiming 100% uh, improvement like this. And the last one, partial pictures. If you don't see the entire picture... Uh, um, that could be misleading. So here's another one uh, for partial pictures. 90%, think about this, 90% of all cars sold in the country in the last 10 years are still on the road. What does that tell you about the cars? Well, if 90% of them are still on the, that were sold in the last 10 years are still on the road, that means they're pretty reliable, Right? That means they work very well. Well, that's not the whole picture. What if we said that the 90% that were sold were actually sold in the last three years? Well, then you don't know because you need more time for the car to break, right? But that first phrase sounds very um, 
authoritative. And it sounds like, oh, wow, we have all these cars that are being sold that have uh, good reliability. So partial pictures. Sometimes they, uh, people, uh, on purpose, they distort so that uh, they don't... Um, sorry, that was a different one. Partial pictures is when you're not given all of the information. It's just a statement that actually misleads you to think a certain way um, because you don't have all of the information. Um, on the homework, when you go through, there'll be several exercises that will ask you about which type of bias is this or which type of abuse, if you will, this is in terms of sampling. So I'd like to go through those really quick before we finish with this section. So sampling bias, when the sample is not representative of the population. And here's an example of that. Studying the effects of statistics education on all students, Wendy surveys all the males. Well, that's not the representative uh, sample of education on all students, right? Not all students are male. So that's sampling bias. Voluntary response bias is when uh, we have sampling bias that often occurs when the sample is volunteers. Usually volunteers want their opinion heard, right? So an example of that would be, Sarah wants to know what students thought about abortion at her college. She stood at a busy walkway and loud, loudly shouted, who wants to take a survey about, on abortion? Right? That's not a good way uh, to get information because only the uh, strongly opinionated people will come up and take that survey. Uh, that would be called the voluntary response bias. Self-interest study uh, is bias that can occur when the researchers have an interest in the outcome. So Texas Instruments, for instance, a calculator company for the most part, does a study and concludes that students prefer to use graphing calculators over computer software for mathematical classes. Well, of course, they would want that to be the conclude, uh, conclusion because they're a calculator company, right? So that would be a self-interest study. Uh, response bias. Uh, when the responder gives inaccurate responses for any reason. So that's actually number five and number six uh, after this. This is like an umbrella term, response bias. Um, so an example of that really quickly is Jake surveyed border patrol agents asking them whether they, re they really believe that a wall on the U.S.-Mexico border would be a good idea. Most would answer what is socially acceptable, right? Think about that. Uh, they don't want to share their opinion because... This is a uh, very uh, charged question. Um, so response bias. There's different reasons why a person would give a certain response or would give an inaccurate response. And this is like an umbrella term for the next two, five and six. Perceived lack of anonymity is a reason why a person would not want to take a survey. Um, so example of that would be employees are surveyed about which websites they visit while on the job and told that this information will be shared with their boss. Now, of course, they don't want to take that survey, right? Or they don't want to go uh, through that process because they don't want to know what their uh, they don't want their, their boss to know uh, what websites they've w visited on the job, right? That's an example uh, again of response bias. There's inaccurate responses for some reason, and the reason is the lack of anonymity. Loaded questions. When the question wording influences the responses. So, example again is: Does this dress make make me look fat? That's a loaded question, <laughs> right? That's a very loaded question. And that's uh, influencing the uh, person being asked to say a certain uh, thing. So again, that would be another example of response bias that's a little bit more specific because it's a loaded question. Uh, last one here, non-response bias. When people are re refusing to participate in a study can influence the validity of the outcome. So for instance, a restaurant may give each table a customer uh, a customer satisfaction survey with their bill. Um, that is an example of a non-response bias because who are the people that are going to actually take that uh, customer satisfaction survey? Either those people who are really, really excited about the service that they got or those people who had a really bad experience, right? They hated it. And those um, whose opinions are uh, between are not going to be uh, well represented. So that would be an example of non-response bias. Um, there are some very, uh, formulas and some uh, reminders that I need to give you guys before we go on to the next section. And that is, first of all, factorial notation. Factorial notation is this interesting thing where we say, eight factorial. It sounds like I'm screaming, but it's not. This exclamation point is like a symbol in math uh, that says, take this number, it's always an integer, and then take all the numbers starting from it, 
going all the way back to the number one and multiply them. So you can see how this number increases like crazy, right? What's one factorial? One, because one times one, right? Or just one. What's two factorial? Two factorial would be two times one, which is two. What's three factorial? Three factorial would be three times two times one. That would be six. What's uh, four factorial? That would be four times three times two times one, or actually six times four, which is 24, right? Uh, or five factorial, 24 times five, and so forth. So this number uh, increases like crazy. You would say, maybe you'd ask, what about zero? What's zero factorial? And by definition, zero factorial is equal to one. So zero factorial is equal to one, and there's a reason for that because some formulas that we have in the future end up having a zero factorial in the denominator of our ratio of our fraction. And we know that the question that we are asking has to have a numerical answer that would actually make sense. But in the calculations, we end up with having a zero factorial in the denominator. And so when we were forced to make that definition that zero factorial is equal to one, so that the, numer uh, the numer uh, numerator, excuse me, uh, which is describing something that we're interested in, whatever the calculation represented, is actually the quantity, uh, the answer. And so zero factorial of the denominator would equal to, uh, be equal to one. Um, I'm sorry, I didn't write that down. I, I wish I'd be able to take notes right on top of these slides. Um, but I haven't figured that out yet because Google doesn't allow me. Um, I'll figure that out a little bit later. The other thing that I want to make sure you guys uh, remember are the order of operations. Remember, you calculate things that are in the parentheses first, then powers and exponents, multiply, divide, left to right, add, subtract, left to right, like you're reading a book, right? And so if you remember, this is PEMDAS, P-E-M-D-A-S, P parentheses, E exponents, M-D is multiplication division, A-S is addition, subtraction, left to right. Okay, so keep those calculations in mind as we proceed uh, and get to some finally some calculations here in a little bit. So our last section is about collecting sample data. Um, let's do that in another video. We're going to take a look at sampling um, ways that we can sample. Again, the best way to sample is random, um, and we'll talk about that, what that means and what the definition is in the next video.